CWPA Remote Professional Edition, where we take a look at water polo players and where they are today. This man was a member of the Harvard University Crimson men's varsity water polo team from 1989 to 1993. After graduating with a degree in history, he went on to medical school at Johns Hopkins. And now he is one of the world's foremost pediatric brain surgeons. I'm so very pleased to be joined today by David Sandberg. David, thanks so much for appearing on CWPA Remote. Thank you so much for having me. So how and why did you choose Harvard? Well, I chose Harvard because, you know, it's a wonderful school. My older sister went there and, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to go to a fantastic academic school. And academics have always been my primary focus. It was also an amazing opportunity to play Division I athletics and to be on the, a part of the water polo team. So do you remember what your very first practice was like? Huh. My first practice was in preseason before we started freshman year we went out and trained as a team with um, coach Rich Corso who was at the time the coach of Harvard Westlake later became the national team coach mm -hmm. uh, and we practiced with him early in the morning and I remember uh, standing on the deck of the pool at four or five in the morning it was very early practice we were doing two-day oh. practices and it was absolutely freezing out and the pool was freezing too. That's what I remember. I remember many things from those practices. But. <laughs> well, um, do you remember your first game? I don't remember my first game. Um, you know, I was, I considered myself lucky to make the team and to be a part of the team. And I sat the bench for most of my four years. I can tell you about, a, a, you know, little moments of glory here and there, but um, most of my time was spent <laughs> cheering my teammates on, to be truthful. Well, <laughs> and that's okay. But how, how about one of those little moments of glory? Do you remember your first goal? I don't remember my first goal, but I remember my last goal. Okay, let's I, talk about I, that one. When I was a senior, um, we were um, playing in the Eastern Conference Tournament. And if we won, we would move on. And if not, we, would, we wouldn't. We were playing the United States Naval Academy. Their team was better than ours. And... Um, you know, we lost by a lot, um, but because I was a senior and it was clear this was going to be my last game, they put me in for the last few minutes of the game for kind of garbage time. But in those couple minutes that I was there with about a minute left, um, I got the ball and somehow scored a goal. And so I ended my career um, with, with that glory to score, you know, in the pool in the, against the United States Naval Academy against better players. And I was super happy. I'm sure you would be. That's a great way to, to end the career. So uh, what is your single best memory of water polo at Harvard? I have so many great memories, but my, I mean, what I, what I took away from water polo, in addition to um, just the hard work that goes into the practices, was the bonding of being part of a team with an amazing group of individuals. Um, even before I got to college, um, just because of this preseason training, I had a set group of friends. You know, most people show up to college and they don't know anybody. And, you know, it's a little scary probably for some people. For me, I had spent two weeks out in California, day in and day night, you know, day in and day out, sleeping, eating, practicing, um, and getting to know some extraordinary guys who became my best friends throughout college and many of whom I still keep in touch with. Well, uh, certainly that's a great way for a lot of athletes to get into college uh, once they're, you know, admitted in their freshman. Uh, I'm interested in your, your general and specific reflections on your water polo career at Harvard, including anything that may have been uh, amusing, uh, unusual, uh, anything, you know, during your time with the Crimson Water Polo. I mean, lots of, lots of amusing moments. Um, we're all ears one small side story um would be we used to do this i don't know if they still do this we would we would have a competition that would be called the schmen of the year schmen being freshmen mm -hmm. and it was a facetious thing it was mostly making fun of the freshmen but in a in a good humored way um and the upperclassmen would mysteriously post rankings in the locker room they would just print out from their computers 
piece of paper in which they would list all the freshmen and put just nonsense garbage about them and <laughs> rank them in terms of where they would be in the Schmen of the year rankings. Um, and then at the end of the year, they would have a Schmen of the year party where they would, you know, there was plenty of alcohol involved. And this was after the season, of course. And um, they would choose the person who was the Schmen of the year. I was actually honored to be chosen as the Schmen of the year. I don't know if it was <laughs> actually an honor. Maybe it <laughs> means <laughs> that I was a, a laughing stock, but it was, it was a lot of great memories. Well, what were some of the qualities that they listed you high on? <laughs> no, it was the person who was the most schmenly, which is probably not a compliment. No, <laughs> most like a freshman, I guess. <laughs> and one other thing, one funny story um, from our time in preseason uh, freshman training, we we're training with the water polo team before college started. The upperclassmen pulled a stunt on us freshmen and kept, them us, you know, kept us up all night one night. And then we had training the next morning. And, you know, I, I guess, wasn't tough enough and couldn't hack it. So I fell asleep on the coach's office. The coach who was training us was uh, Rich Corso, who later became the national team coach of the United States national team. And he found me asleep in his office on the floor. And he said, that guy looks like a rug asleep on my office. And he decided for the rest of the training camp to call me rug. And so before I even got to college, all of my classmates called me Rug. That was my nickname. Many of them still do to this day. And even when I got to college throughout the four years, learning from the water polo team, many other people who weren't water polo players called me Rug. So I went through college. That was my nickname, Rug. Um, years, years later, actually, I was traveling around Europe. And at that point, Coach Corso had become the national team coach. And right. um, I was, happened to be in Budapest. And by chance, I saw a notice on a poll saying that the United States, Nas United States national team water polo was playing against the Hungarian national team, you know, show up at this pool at some time. So I went, I was so excited. There were a few fans in the stands, as is the case for many water polo games. And so I, I could just go up to the coach at the end of the game and he remembered me and I reminded him that he had given him my nickname and we had a good laugh about that. I'm sure you did. <laughs> Any disappointments along the way? You know, I never had any disappointments um, in, in water polo. My, you know, my background in terms of getting into water polo, you know, many water, most of the water polo players at Harvard came from California, where water polo mm -hmm. is obviously the strongest in our country. I was from South Florida, and I originally was a basketball player. And, um, you know, my dad had played basketball in college. I spent my whole childhood trying to be good at basketball. My dad was 6'5", and I thought I was going to grow and be that big, but I stopped growing at 6'1". And my freshman year in high school, I quickly realized that I was not able to dunk and I was not going to be good <laughs> enough to get any significant playing on the basketball team. And I just was upset about it. And I decided I need to find a new sport. So I first started playing water polo in 10th grade in high school. And I'd never swam competitively before either. And I worked really, really hard at it. And I became good enough so that I did pretty well in high school, at least in the Miami setting. I was second team all county. Mm -hmm. uh, by my senior year, I was the best player on my team. I was setting a hole. Um, I was still dramatically worse than the players in California, you know, who, you know, both, both the high school and college letter level. And I was good enough not to be recruited by Harvard, but to kind of make the team and be part of the group and, you know, to get some garbage playing time here and there. But I was so honored to be part of the team. I was so happy. It's not like I thought that I was better than the guys you know, who were, who were starting ahead of me and wished I could get more playing time. Of course, I longed for minutes in the pool and wished I could get in. And mostly I would play when we were killing weaker teams or getting killed by better teams towards the end of games. But I never thought I deserved any more playing time that I got. I was honored to be part of a team, loved the guys, um, loved, you know, just working hard and training and getting in shape and you know, just the experience of being part of a, a varsity team in college, to me, I was always tremendously honored. So I sat the bench for four years. Um, I lettered each year and I was, I was proud of it. You know, I loved it. And so you should be. So before we get into your current situation, uh, it's an interesting switch, at least on paper, that you graduated as a history major and you end up in medical school. So how about a little explanation on that? Yeah, I mean, most, uh, most, doctors or science majors. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be a doctor from the, from the beginning, but you know, I had the perspective to also know that I was never going to be able to study anything outside of medicine. Once I became a doctor in college, you, you can major in anything and go to medical school. You just have to take the pre-medical requirements. 
um, I thought it was a good opportunity to learn about something different that I wasn't going to have for my whole career, but could become a passion of mine, just learning about history. So that's why I decided, I decided to major in history. In retrospect, at least for me, for some people, that's a wonderful decision. In retrospect, if I were doing it over again, I would do, I would do it differently. Okay. And why pediatric brain surgery or how? Yeah. Well, you know, I went to medical school mm -hmm. um, and I kind of loved every area of medicine. I thought initially I was going to, I'd spent a lot of time in addition to um, water polo at college. My other major activity was I directed a homeless shelter and I loved working with, um, with, um, you know, indigent patients who were from inner cities. I thought I would do primary care medicine. Somehow though, when I got to, me to medical school, <clears throat> I fell in love with neurosurgery. You know, you kind of know what your passion is once you discover it. And I had the opportunity to spend a month doing neurosurgery uh, with some extraordinary individuals at Johns Hopkins Medical School. And, you know, I knew that this was what I wanted to do for my life's work. And so I fell into it and it's been amazing. Well, along the way, you, you've pioneered some, some tremendously great new treatments. Uh, could you highlight a couple for our viewers and, and tell us how they came about? I wouldn't say I've pioneered anything yet. I would say I'm working hard to try to come up with new treatments for children with malignant brain tumors. So specifically, and I don't want to get into too much detail, yeah. um, you know, children have a lot of side effects from chemotherapy, especially that they get for brain tumors because it's hard to get drugs into the brain. So I work on local drug delivery in a certain spot of the brain. I infuse drugs in a spot where nobody else has infused them before, which is the site of malignant tumors in the brain. And I, I, I hope to get very high drug levels and hopefully come up with better ways of treating children with you know, these devastating malignant brain tumors. Well, uh, that's tremendous to hear and, and hope, you know, great success for you, uh, hopefully to achieve that uh, in full. But to dispel some of the, the crazy things people are probably thinking about when they think about brain surgeons, you know, a big buzzsaw, you know, cutting somebody's skull open. Uh, can you give a little bit of, of insight into actually what happens? Being in the operating room is, is my haven. I'm super focused, much like a water polo game. When you are in the pool and you are competing against a component, there's nothing else on your mind. You're not thinking about, you know, if you're a college student, you're not thinking about your next test or your girlfriend or whatever else. You're focused on doing your very best and helping your team win. It's a team approach. There are many people in the operating room. There are anesthesiologists. There are residents in training. There are fellows in training. Um, you know, and everyone focused around a little patient. In my case, it's, it's a baby or a young child most of the time. And we're focused on the task at hand. Um, some surgeries are very short. Some of them are long. They can be 10 hours, 12 hours. We're working meticulously in, you know, important structures of the brain and trying to, you know, accomplish a specific goal, whether it be to remove a tumor or a vascular malformation of the brain or many other things that we do. And, and how is your current time split? Because obviously you must have a research component. You, you obviously have an operating component. Uh, maybe you're also doing managerial duties, uh, you know, teaching duties. Like yeah. give our viewers a, a, a peek inside a week uh, for Dave, you know, Dr. David Sandberg. I, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a lot of things at once. There's a lot of overlap and I'm, you know, pretty good at time management. But my primary focus is my patients. You know, I have children who are under my care, um, whose families are going through the hardest moment in their lives. And so my primary focus is, you know, many surgeries. Um, I average doing about 20 surgeries per month. Um, and so I'm doing lots of surgical procedures and I'm very focused during that time. Um, managing the patients postoperatively, spending lots of time with their families, seeing lots of patients in the clinic. When I'm not doing those things, I'm heavily focused on research. I'm doing um, uh, research to try to come up with new treatments for brain tumors, as we discussed, both clinical trials in humans and also translational trials. And I have laboratory partners. Um, and then, you know, teaching lectures, um, answering emails from around the country, patient inquiries. You know, I get hundreds of emails a day and just trying to keep it above, above water and spend some time with my family. So <laughs> really, really, you need a full-time personal assistant. So you, you mentioned working uh, in homeless shelters. That uh, leads me to a, a question. You make an annual trip to Haiti. Uh, yeah. Can you tell our viewers about that, how it came to be, and what you do? 
Yeah, so um, I've always been involved. As I said, you know, I was in, involved with the homeless and I always wanted to do something service oriented. That's how I got to medicine. And the one thing I was worried about when I chose neurosurgery as a career is it's kind of hard to focus on the indigent um, in that specific field. Um, but, you know, in developing countries, there's so much need. Um, and I, I, I've been on many trips, you know, in various parts of uh, the developing world. And we focused on Haiti because it's so close to the United States. It's the poorest um, region in the Western hemisphere um, where the poverty rivals that of, of the poorest regions of the world in, in East Africa. And, um, you know, there's really no good access to care for children who have neurosurgical conditions there. So I take a team down annually. Unfortunately, this year it was canceled because of COVID. Um, but we take a team down annually and we perform about 25 surgeries on children. We teach a Haitian neurosurgeon down there how to do those surgeries, you know, kind of the teach a man to fish concept, which is so important. Yep. And, um, you know, it's a very meaningful experience for us and our team. And we realize how blessed we are to have access to the care we have for our own children here in the United States. And is part of that also getting them the equipment that they need? Because obviously there's got to be a tremendous amount of highly specialized equipment in order to be able to handle these surgeries. Yeah, we do a specific subset of surgeries that are possible to do there. And we bring our own equipment that's portable for those specific surgeries. Mostly we're doing minimally invasive surgeries in the brain with an endoscope, which is a little camera to treat a problem with fluid circulation in the brain called hydrocephalus. And we can handle bringing the equipment for that. Well, it's a great thing that you do, and, and hopefully you'll be able to get back to that, you know, very shortly. Um, I can't wait. Yeah, so we've talked a bit about your college water polo career, and we've talked about your, your medical career. Uh, be interested in hearing how you feel any component of your college water polo career has uh, impacted your working career. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I wouldn't say there's a specific connection between um, – water polo per se compared to any other sport and my and my working career what i can say is that being a college athlete and even though i sat the bench i was serious about it i worked hard at it you know i trained as hard as i could and um you know there were two-a-day practices and you know in between the two-a-day practices there were laboratories that i needed to do for science classes we were taking very hard basic science classes at harvard for the pre-med requirements i was a serious student i was running a homeless shelter also so I think what water polo was a specific chunk of time that was allotted and I needed to focus on being organized and being organized is good in life, no matter what mm -hmm. your, your career is. So basically one of the things that being a, a, a college athlete helped me do was learn time management because in college, you got a lot of time on your hands in general. You know, you take a couple classes a day and, you know, some people spend the rest of the time, you know, goofing off or doing whatever. I basically, allotted for every hour of my day you know and of course I went to parties and I was a normal college student I had friends and had lots of great memories of that but basically you know I went to my classes I kind of went to sleep early many nights earlier than my friends um, I got up in the morning I went to practice I did you know did my 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 schoolwork I studied hard I worked on the homeless shelter stuff I was just extremely busy and being an, being a, a college athlete was was really important in learning to uh, prioritize tasks and just be efficient, which helps you no matter what you do. For sure, especially with all the tasks you have to manage right now in your, in your career. Yeah. Uh, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you stopped and said, you know, I can draw from that and whatever that is from my college water polo, uh, and then you're able to deal with the situation. Has that ever happened? I haven't really thought about that per se. What I would say is that um, water polo is a hard sport. You know, it's physically hard. The practices are hard. The swimming sets are hard, particularly for me. I wasn't a swimmer growing up. And, you know, I swam to the point of vomiting or near vomiting in some of the practices. The sets that we had to do, you know, on the time intervals were faster than I could do them sometimes, you know, and I was the last, I was the slowest, one of the slowest, if not the slowest on the team. The practices were really hard. And I think that was really good for me. You know, it really pushed me to the point of exhaustion. Um, you know, my career is a challenging one physically. You know, I'm, I'm going to turn 50 years old this year. I'm up many nights doing surgeries in the middle of the night. I have to work the next day. 
it's physically challenging. You know, it's mentally challenging. Um, we have challenging emotional situations to deal with. Um, I think pushing myself to my limits physically as a water polo player is something that I'm still doing as a neurosurgeon, but in kind of different ways. I mean, it really helped me when I was a resident in training. It was back before mm -hmm. the work hour restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I worked many days and nights in a row um, where today people would say that's unsafe. Um, for me, I would say it was really good for my development and being a water polo player, getting up early for practices, having to, you know, stay up studying, you know, trying to just put it all together. I don't know. I think water polo made me tougher. And being a neurosurgeon in some ways is kind of like being a Marine. And being a water polo player is kind of like being a Marine too. And so, I don't know, made me tougher. All right. Well, many people at your station in life uh, will get asked uh, to uh, give advice to their younger uh, self. But uh, rather than say, what would you say to uh, college David, uh, I like to look at it the other way around. Uh, I'd like to know, what would college David say to current David? I don't know. I mean, I'm so lucky. I'm so happy. You know, I just, I've been so fortunate to, to be able to follow my dreams and accomplish my goals. I, you know, I have a career that, um, I have a career that I'm passionate about, um, that I care deeply about and I get to impact people's lives and, you know, um, that was what I hoped to have. And, you know, I also am blessed to have a wonderful family, amazing children. Um, so my life is working out exactly as I hoped that it would. So my, my college self would have no great advice for my current <laughs> self other than to feel that I'm very lucky and fortunate. Well, uh, it's great that that's your, your situation. So lastly, we, we do have high school water polo players and their parents who are looking at colleges. Uh, we have current college players uh, that are looking at uh, careers post-college. Uh, what advice would you give them about how uh, collegiate water polo uh, can help them, impact them uh, in their future career? I mean, the first thing I would say, to be honest, is realistically, you know, at least, you know, for those water polo players who are also very serious about academics, you should have the long-term perspective to know that, um, you know, you're not going to make a living playing water polo. First of all, it's kind of impossible to make a living playing water polo. Some you can play in Europe, but, um, you know, it's not basketball. It's not football. You're not going to, you know, make millions of dollars being an athlete professionally. So have the focus to choose your school, not only based upon the water polo program, but also based upon the academic program and what you're actually going to do when you finish, you know. On the other hand, I think being a water polo player is a tremendously positive part of a college experience. So if you have an opportunity, knowing your own skill, skill level, to be on a water polo team, you know, I would strongly encourage you to do it because it will majorly impact you. And it also makes connections that helps, um, you know, in terms of jobs and things in the future. You know, we're a tight group, the water polo players, and we help each other out. And so it's really a major social group and a connection group for later. And so what I would say is, you know, choose your school, not only based on the water polo program, but consider the academics seriously. Um, but also, you know, all else being equal, if you have a chance to play water polo collegiate in a collegiate level versus another school where you don't have a chance, think seriously about doing it. Uh, great advice. And I'm sure everybody uh, has taken it to heart. Uh, he followed his uh, career as a water polo player at Harvard to become one of the world's foremost pediatric brain surgeons. Uh, Dr. David Sandberg has been my guest today on CWPA Remote. Uh, David, again, thanks so much for sharing your insights on collegiate water polo and, and how they, uh, the situation can impact your career later on. So nice to talk to you and thank you very, very much. Until next time, this is George Gross Jr. wishing all of our viewers the very best in and out of the pool.